Hello, Bay Ridge. Welcome back to another in these uh, special editions of After Hours where we're taking extended time just with audio to look through Mark chapter 13, uh, basically a verse or a few verses at a time to really try and cover and understand what Mark is teaching in this really important passage. So today I want to talk about uh, Mark 13 verses 26 and 27, uh, where Jesus is talking about the Son of Man gathering the elect. I did cover some of this uh, in the teaching on Sunday, October the 20th. You can look there and see some of the teaching there, but I'll go into a little bit of extra information today. So beginning in verse 26, Jesus speaks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. He says, at that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Now, a lot of people, again, want to take this and say, see, that has to be not about the destruction of the temple, but rather about Jesus coming back at the end of human history, his final return, or some think it might be referring to the rapture, but actually it does not. The problem here is we need to remember to read what Jesus is saying in light of the Old Testament. And when we look there, we see that what Jesus is doing here is he's making a reference to the Old Testament text, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, we read, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. So notice Jesus here is referencing this text, the preeminent son of man text in the Old Testament. This one like a son of man coming with the clouds. So again, there's now the clouds. Uh, of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and power. So notice we have Son of Man, coming clouds, great power, glory. All of those are in Daniel 7, 13, and 14, and in Mark 13, 26. Jesus is clearly making a reference back to there. But notice Daniel's vision is not about the end of the world, uh, but rather about the enthronement of the Son of Man. And notice that the coming with the clouds in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, is not a coming from heaven down to earth on the clouds, but rather the Son of Man is ascending up to the Ancient of Days to uh, take the throne in heaven. So it's riding the clouds up to heaven, not down to earth. So the focus in Daniel, and therefore in Jesus' words in Mark chapter 13, is Jesus the Son of Man ascending to the Father's right hand to be enthroned as the Lord of heaven and earth? And this is important because, again, this doesn't happen at the end of history. Jesus is already enthroned right now with great power and glory and has been since the ascension. When he ascended to the Father's right hand, he was exalted as Lord of all. Peter tells us that, for example, in Acts chapter 2. So Jesus is seated as the Son of Man, ruling and reigning over all things with glory and power right now. That's not something in our future. It's something that has been happening. But notice in the Daniel text, very importantly, verse 14 continues to speak and tell us that as the exalted king, the Son of Man receives worship from people of every nation. So in verse 14, we read, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So the Son of Man is the exalted king. And we see here he's not just calling people from Israel to worship, but rather he's calling people from every nation. All people's nations and men of every language worship him. They are becoming part of his people and they are worshiping him. This is an amazing thing because, of course, at the time of Daniel and the Old Covenant, uh, membership in the people of God and the worship of the God of Israel was overwhelmingly restricted to the nation of Israel, to ethnic Jews. But here in Daniel 7, we see that the power and the glory of the Son of Man, Jesus, are seen in the fact that he's going to call people from everywhere to be part of his new covenant people. And of course, this has in fact been happening for 2,000 years. This isn't something that happens at the end of all time. Rather, this is something that was to happen when Jesus set up his throne. And his kingdom that he sets up then is contrasted with the kingdoms of men because Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the four 
empires that Daniel deals with in his visions in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and then 8, 9 and throughout the rest of the book, those four kingdoms, they all pass away. But the kingdom that Jesus has set up as the Son of Man will never pass away. Now, this is important that verse 14 immediately goes into this calling people from every nation because that's exactly what Jesus turns to in verse 27. So notice in Matthew 13, verse 27, we read, And he, the Son of Man, will send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So verse 27 is not a new subject, but the continuation of the reference to Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Verse 26, men will see the Son of Man come in the clouds with great power and glory, is a reference to Daniel 7, 13, in the very beginning of verse 14. The Son of Man, the clouds, the great power and glory. Uh, this is the ascension in session, uh, as it's called, Jesus sitting uh, and ruling at the Father's right hand. Verse 27, then, sending out the angels, gathering the elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. This is a reference back to Daniel 7, 14, where the kingdom is set up and people from all nations are brought to worship the Son of Man. So this is speaking of the new covenant reality that God is now calling people from every nation to be part of his people. And in fact, they are coming. And this is not a minor point. This is not some throwaway point Jesus makes in uh, Mark 13, 26, and 27. The whole book of Acts, for example, is built around this vision of the gospel going forth to the ends of the earth. That as a result of Jesus ascending to the Father's right hand, the gospel is going to go forth to the nations. So we see, if you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, um, this is kind of the theme verse for the whole book of Acts. We read, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this is describes the entire structure of the book of Acts. You're going to be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem. That's Acts chapter uh, 1 through chapter 7. Everything is in uh, Jerusalem. In Samaria and all Judea, that is Acts chapter 8 through 12, and then to the ends of the earth, Acts 13 to 28. The entire book is structured around this outward movement of the gospel, that with Jesus now as the ascended Son of Man is no longer calling people just from Jerusalem or even from Samaria and all Judea, but is in fact calling people from the ends of the earth, the four corners, everything under heaven. And so it's not a surprise to see that the book of Acts ends with the Apostle Paul uh, in Rome, which to the Jews was the ends of the earth, and the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 28, 28 to 30, Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. And then Luke adds in verse 30, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. So the gospel had been going to the Gentiles from very early in the book, but at the end of Acts, Paul indicates it'll be sent in a new way to the Gentiles and they would listen. And this is spoken, and it's important for us to understand, this is sometime between 60 and 65 AD, shortly before the destruction of the temple and the final abolishing of the old covenant. Paul's in jail there in Rome. Church history tells us that he got released then and was brought back later. But in any event, it's it's clear this is before the big persecution in Rome that started around 64 AD. So Paul is somewhere in the early part of the 60s speaking these words. Uh, this is on the cusp of just before the, the war against Rome starts in Israel that culminates in the destruction of the temple and the final abolishment of the Old Testament. So this is ultimately the fulfillment of Daniel 7, 14 and Mark chapter 13, verse 27, that in fact, the gospel is going forth to all the nations. Now, that's what's there in the text, but there are objections that are brought forward, and so I want to take a few minutes to try and answer those. First objection that some say is, well, it says the elect, but the elect refers to Israel as God's chosen people. Israel is known as the elect. 
but there's many problems with this. First off, the context again is a reference to Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And in that text, the point is that the Son of Man is the Lord over all nations and people from all nations will worship him. So to try and restrict the chosen people or the elect to Israel turns Daniel 7, 14 on its head. It's ignoring the Old Testament text that Jesus is referencing. But more than that, there's also the fact that Mark chapter 13 is about the destruction of the temple and the end of the Old Covenant. I remind us, Jesus is actually not answering questions about the end of the world, but rather the temple's going to be destroyed. When's this going to happen? What are going to be the signs? And that all of this would happen in this generation. And so it's about the destruction of the temple, the end of the Old Covenant. And in the New Covenant, the elect people of God is not Israel, but everyone who believes in Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. So there's many texts that we could take to look at this, but I'll just take a couple of them. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is laboring actually in a predominantly Gentile context, though there are certainly Jews involved there. But notice the elect are those who are finding salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's not just Jews. That's not the nation of Israel. Rather, it is any who find salvation in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul had earlier written the Galatians. And he goes to great lengths to show that the seed of Abraham is none other than Jesus. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And the only way to be the seed of Abraham is to be in Jesus. And so he concludes this part of his argument in Galatians 3, 28 and 29 with the words, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In the new covenant, there is no more Jew or Greek in terms of salvation and being the people of God. Obviously, people still recognize that they were either ethnically Jewish or they were ethnically Greek, just like they are uh, biologically either male or female, and you were in your circumstances either slave or free, but none of that had anything to do with being uh, saved, being part of the people of God, being the elect and chosen of God. None of that is of any advantage or disadvantage. All that matters now is belonging to Christ through faith. That's what determines who the seed of Abraham is in the New Covenant, and that determines what it means to be the elect of God. So actually, to try and restrict this text in, in Mark chapter 13, verse 27, and say, well, the elect is Israel, is to undermine and deny the new covenant. The point of what Jesus is making is the old covenant is going away, and it's going away forever. It is never to return. And when that happens, the elect is no longer Israel. It is anyone who believes in Christ Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile. Israel is certainly included, but it is not restricted to them. It is Jew and Gentile. So to try and restrict the elect to Israel is to, again, ignore the entire context and the entire sweep of Scripture and the meaning of the new covenant. Some then come forward and say, well, if it's not that, but the text says angels are going to gather the elect, and that did not happen prior to 70 AD. So we can see in Mark 13, 27, it does say he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. Now, the basic meaning of the Greek word there that is translated angels, that, that word is angelos, which we can see easily is the word from which we get angel. But the basic meaning of that word is a messenger. Now, that means that the Greek word angelos refers to something that is a messenger. Now, first, it can and often does refer to angels, supernatural heavenly beings. So we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 19, just to take one of many, many examples, the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. That clearly is referencing a supernatural heavenly being. 
he is a messenger he is bringing a message from god but clearly this particular use of it is to refer to a supernatural heavenly being and we should be clear this is the most common way the word is used in the new testament so it is possible jesus could be saying that angels are helping the gospel to spread to all nations Revelation 14, 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So notice the gospel is going forth to all nations in accord with what Daniel 7, 14 said and Mark 13, 27. And here it speaks of an angel flying in midair. This seems to be a supernatural heavenly being. So it is possible that Jesus could be making a reference that the angels are somehow involved in the proclamation of the gospel. And it's true that the gospel does go forth via spiritual warfare. And perhaps this is what is being communicated. But I have to point out it would be very, very unusual to speak of angels taking the gospel forth in this way. In the New Testament, even when angels show up, for example, to Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter uh, 10, they do not speak the gospel. Rather, they say, go get Peter, send for Peter, and he will come and tell you the gospel. Um, so it would be very unusual to have an angel proclaiming the gospel, but it is possible that it could be done. But there is another way to read the Greek word angelos, and also I would point out the Hebrew word malak is the same way. They can refer to human messengers. The basic meaning of the word is a messenger. In the New Testament, very often that is a supernatural heavenly being that is acting as a messenger, but it can simply be a human being who's acting as a messenger. For example, in Matthew eleven ten, and this is also in Mark 1, uh, verse 2. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Mark quotes that at the beginning of his gospel. Here, Jesus actually brings this reference up, and it's speaking about John the Baptist. And the word there is angelos, the same word that is used in Mark 13, 27. Uh, and John the Baptist was not a heavenly being Rather, he is a human messenger who's preparing the way before the Messiah. We also read in Luke 9, 52, that uh, Jesus sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. These messengers are just human beings. They're to the disciples. They're not supernatural, heavenly beings. And it's the word uh, angeloi. It's, it's the plural form of it. But it is the same word uh, that is being used here. So clearly the word can be used of human messengers. And in fact, the, the Greek word angelos and, and the Hebrew word malak referred to human messengers about 50% of the time in the Old Testament usually to refer to people carrying a message from a king or to refer to prophets of the Lord. So in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 9, for example, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, receives a report and he's going to go away. And we're told that when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. The word there is malak in the Hebrew or angelos in the Greek, and it just means they were human messengers. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 15 and 16, which again is the last book in the Hebrew order of the Old Testament, uh, so right near the end of the Old Testament, God is explaining why Israel was sent away into exile. And we read this in 2 Chronicles 36, 15 and 16. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent a word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and his, on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. The messengers here are the prophets. They are not uh, heavenly beings. They're not angels in the sense of what we do. To hear the word angelos or the word malak refers to human messengers who God has sent forth to carry forth his message. So we see that this is very often, again, it's, it's about 50% of the time in the Old Testament. These words are not used of heavenly beings, but rather uh, messengers sent from a king and specifically of the prophets of the Lord who are coming to 
speak the word of God or to call people to uh, God. Now, given the context of the quote from Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the Old Testament usage for messengers of a king and for prophets and messengers of the Lord, and that that's actually the most common usage in the Old Testament, and the New Testament emphasis on people rather than heavenly beings taking the gospel to the nations, I think the better idea here is actually messenger. I think that is the more likely meaning. But even if one wants to say that uh, it is um, you know, the heavenly beings that are doing this. The idea is not a supernatural gathering such as the rapture or that there are some writers that say Israel is going to be regathered to the land, which gets into all kinds of other theological problems. Um, but they say that they're going to be carried by some supernatural transport by angels. There's nothing in the text that it's about that. It's rather about the proclamation of the gospel, which gathers people from every nation under heaven into the people of God. And, and Jesus had already spoken about this earlier, that the gospel of the kingdom was going to be preached to all nations. That was in Mark 13, 10. So however we take this verse, it is about the proclamation of the gospel calling people to the Lord. I think it's most likely that the messengers are intended to be you and I, uh, believers carrying the gospel forth, but even if it is spiritual warfare and angels are somehow involved in a way that we don't fully understand, it's about the proclamation of the gospel, not a rapture or something like that. Now, the final argument regarding this or objection is, well, in Matthew 24, it's a little, it speaks of it a little bit differently. You're quoting out of Mark, but Matthew uses an additional phrase. In Matthew 24, 31, we read, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And so here, Matthew says there's a trumpet call. And since Matthew links the gathering of the elect with an angel and a trumpet call, some make a link with that verse and Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 4:16 and 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Those two passages read, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, we read, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so notice what they're linking there is the Lord on the clouds being the Lord coming down, that there's the voice of the archangel and a trumpet call of God. So they would see... Jesus, the angel, and the trumpet, and say this is happening at the end of time. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we read in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So there is this link that we can see here with this, but that's not actually a link that is relevant to the text in Matthew chapter 24. And we can see this from several things. Number one, in Revelation, there are many angels sounding trumpet blasts that do not refer to the final trumpet at the final return of Christ to the earth. So just because there's a mention of an angel with a trumpet doesn't mean it refers to the final return of Christ uh, and the archangel trumpet blast. In fact, most of the references of the New Testament are in Revelation and are not a reference to that. If you just count them up, and I don't remember the exact number, but most of the time we're told in the New Testament that there's an angel and a trumpet. It has nothing to do with the final return of Christ. There are many, many of these trumpet blasts that go on. So we can't assume that it has anything to do with the final return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. And that is the most salient point. Remember that Matthew 24 is not about the final return of Christ, but rather about the destruction of the temple and the end of the Old Covenant era. And Jesus promised that all of the events between Matthew 24, 1 and verse 34 would happen during the time of this generation. So the resurrection of the dead has not happened. Uh, you know, death has not been swallowed up in victory. That it's patently obvious has not occurred at that point. And so the reference here cannot be to that final trumpet blast because Jesus has told us in Matthew 24, 1 
to 4 that he's talking about the destruction of the temple and in verse 34 he said that everything between verse 1 and verse 34 was going to happen during this generation and that includes this trumpet blast so it cannot be the one that is linked with the final return of Christ the swallowing up of death the resurrection of the dead if it's not that then what is the trumpet uh referring to well the trumpet referred to in matthew 24 31 is related to the use of trumpets in the old testament in the old testament trumpets were used to call israel to assemble and also to take off and you know march out to go forth uh, under the leadership of the lord and they also announced the year of jubilee in the old testament so in numbers chapter 10 we read about the trumpets uh, that were used and we read this the Lord said to Moses make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and for having camps set out so notice there in verses in numbers chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 that they were to make these two specific silver trumpets and whenever they wanted to gather the people of God together the trumpets were blown in verse 3 we read when the trump when both are sounded the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting so god is assembling his people he's calling and gathering his people that's what the trumpets are used for but if only one is sounded we read in verse 4 the leaders the heads of the clans are to assemble when a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sounding of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be the signal for setting out. To gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the same signal. So notice, the trumpets could be used to either send forth messengers, or to send forth the people of God, or to call them together. So the trumpets are blown for both of them, and they have a distinct sound or a distinct number in how they're doing this. So the trumpet in Matthew 24, 31 could refer to the trumpet telling the messengers to go forth to the four corners of the earth, which is what Paul was indicating in Acts 28, 31. The gospel's gonna be going to the Gentiles and they are going to listen. Or it could refer to the trumpet which called God's people to gather. Uh, either of these purposes or both would fit Matthew 24, 31. The specific reference there does say that it's going to gather the people together. So it seems like Jesus is using this analogy of just as in the old covenant, there were these literal trumpets that blew, that literally called the people together. Here, there, in the new covenant, there's going to be the trumpet blast of the gospel going forth, and it's going to be gathering people into the people of God from all nations. Furthermore, in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, we read that these trumpets are used to announce the great festivals of the Lord. So also at your new times of rejoicing, your appointed feast and new moon festivals, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So the trumpets not only gathered the people in general, they announced the festivals of the Lord, and this was especially true that they were used to announce the beginning of the year of Jubilee, the great year when there was a full forgiveness of debts and everything was restored. We read about this in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 to 10, where uh, in Leviticus 25 it says, Count off seven Sabbaths of years. That's seven seven-year cycles. Seven times seven years. So that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement. Sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. So notice that the trumpets are sounded to announce the Jubilee, which is related to the atonement, the forgiveness of sin, and all debts. 
And also notice that during Jubilee, the people returned to their ancestral family property, which is similar to the gathering there in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. So the trumpets went throughout the land. They were sounded everywhere to let people know it is the time of Jubilee. This is the time of debts forgiven. And that's exactly what has happened in the coming of Jesus. And so I think the strongest note here of the trumpet blast is that with the coming of Christ, with the uh, the new covenant coming in and the old covenant going away, there is jubilee offered to everyone. And it's interesting to note that remember throughout the Olivet Discourse, Jesus has referenced Daniel seven, uh, several times. And one of the key references was that the precursor to the destruction of the temple. The only real sign was the abomination of desolation, which comes out of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. And Jesus had, had noted that uh, earlier in uh, the Olivet Discourse. And, but Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is built around the year of Jubilee because in it there are 70 sevens. And so it's a tenfold jubilee. Instead of seven sevens, there are 70 sevens. It's 490 years, and there's a very complex thing going on here, but it seems to be a way of saying, because it culminates in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, with saying that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to do the final day of atonement. He's going to deal with all sin. It's all going to be put away. And it's in that context then that the abomination that causes desolation is going to come forth. So the Messiah is going to bring in the final fulfillment of Jubilee, not a 49-year cycle, but a 490-year cycle uh, and this is in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which Jesus has been referencing Daniel throughout this whole passage. And so it would make sense for Jesus to continue the Daniel references and to use Jubilee uh, imagery. And this also fits with the entire ministry of Jesus. If you remember, Jesus began his public ministry with a sermon based on Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 looked forward to the future great jubilee that would be ushered in by the messianic servant of the Lord. Jesus does this uh, in his hometown, and Luke records it in Luke 4, uh, 18 to 21. And we read, Jesus told them to, to get the scroll, and they opened to the place of Isaiah. And Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So notice Jesus is beginning his public ministry here in his hometown, and the implication is clear. I'm the Messiah, and that means this text is fulfilled. The year of Jubilee is now arriving. And so Jesus' whole ministry was an announcement of this new jubilee. The, the great jubilee was inaugurated by Jesus, and his messengers were sent forth to announce this to every nation under heaven. This is nothing other than the offer of the full forgiveness of sins, the complete re remittance of our debts against God uh, that is offered to us through Jesus and through the gospel. Now, since this is part of the New Covenant, it was being offered prior to 70 AD, but as with everything else in this passage, there was a time overlap between the ending of the Old Covenant and the beginning of the New Covenant, but that was all brought to an end in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. And so this idea of the trumpet blast and, and the messengers going forth and calling the people of God is announcing the great year of Jubilee, which is the privilege that every Christian has. We get to announce to other, everyone around us that there is the opportunity of debts to be forgiven, of us to be restored in our relationship to God, to proclaim freedom. You don't need to be in bondage to Satan or sin or shame or the world. There is freedom that is offered through Christ. 
And that's really what this passage is about. So Mark 13, 26 and 27, and they're parallel in Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Don't refer to the visible return of Christ and glory at the end of the world when the resurrection is going to occur, but rather they refer to Jesus' enthronement as the Son of Man and the gathering of people from every nation into the new covenant people of God. In short, they were fulfilled prior to 70 AD, and they continue in their ramifications right down to our present day. It's not about us waiting for a supposed rapture in the future, but rather about the privilege we have in receiving full forgiveness of sins in this time of the great jubilee that Jesus has brought in, and us getting to proclaim that privilege and opportunity to every nation under heaven. I hope this helps you understand this passage, and we'll still have one or two more of these sessions to work through the end of the chapter, and then I'll, I'll also give some information on some other books you can take a look at. I hope this is helpful, and I look forward to seeing everybody soon. God bless.